Awesome. Well, welcome to Luminous Church. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us on Next Gen Sunday. Let's give it up for the Next Gen in our church. Let's give it up for them. Can we give it up for those who got baptized as well? <clears throat> My name is William Galloway. I'm one of our ENC campus missionaries at the University of Texas of San Antonio. Do we have any roadrunners in here? You know, we have been in a promises series discovering and tracing the theme of covenant throughout the Bible and how it applies to us, and two, how it changes our lives. You know, we've all made promises that were emotionally or and situationally based before. I know for me, it was, Lord, if you get me out of this, I'll never do it again. Have any of you ever made that promise before? Lord, if you just get me out of this and I make it out of here, I promise I'll serve you for the rest of my life. I promise I'll stop drinking. I promise I'll stop doing X, Y, and Z. But we know all too well of our inability to live up to our words. We know all too well of others' inability to live up to their words. So if we can't keep our promises, why would God keep his? And you know, we're looking for certainty. We want to be assured that the answer is yes. The waiting is the hard part. You're waiting to hear about your college application. You've been through the third round of interviews and you're waiting to hear about the, and you're waiting on the job offer. You're waiting for that friend to pay you back for the lunch that you bought them two months ago. You might as well just keep waiting. I don't think it's going to happen by now. You propose to your girlfriend. She said yes, but you go through premarital counseling, and after each session, you're questioning if they still want to marry you after you ask, knowing this about me, do you still want to get married to me? And you're standing at the altar as the minister reads the vows, and you're waiting for them to say, I do. How many of you are thankful that God's promises to us aren't emotional? They are guaranteed because they're based on his character. But many people don't know the promises of God that, he may, that, that God has for their lives. They don't know the real Jesus and how he comes to make God's promises real to us. So this morning we'll be in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse, verses 16 through 7, 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through 7, 1. And we'll be spending our time answering the question, what are God's promises to me? And through our text and the definition of covenant, we'll find that, number one, God promises himself. Number two, God promises a home or a spiritual family. And number three, God promises holiness. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to 2 Corinthians 6, 16-7-1, and it'll be on the screen. And it reads like this. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty, chapter 7, verse 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word that we have the Old Testament and the New, Co and the New Testament. This is the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. These are promises that you have given us that we might know you and how they apply to us and how they change us. But Lord, we pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you would minister to us and you would open our hearts to receive the promise you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, Paul wrote several letters to a group of people in a church who made a lot of mistakes, and they did not keep their promises to God. He told them that because of Jesus and his faithfulness, we could trust that God would keep his promise and that no matter how many promises God has made, they all find their yes in Jesus. And 2 Corinthians is addressed to the church of God that is at Corinth with the whole of Achaia. And what I love about our family of, Ev of every nation family of churches and campus ministries is that we have an understanding that we and the next generation are all called to be saints together. But he's also writing to the Christians in Corinth who in chapter 6, they say that they're restricted by the Apostle Paul in Christianity. And this is a common cultural belief that we get on the campus about Christianity that the next gen had, they say, I know a few Christians who are nice people, 
But in general, I think they're choosing to live really restricted lives that keep them from enjoying all they could enjoy in this life. The religion prevents them from really living because of all the things they can't do. But he's speaking to his spiritual children, saying, you're not restricted by us, but you're restricted in your own affections, as he says in verse 12 and 13. So we must ask the question, what were their own affections? And then Paul does this weird thing. He gives us the answer in 14 and 15. It says, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? And the answer is none. But you see, the problem that they had there was not so much the relationship with unbelievers, for we know as Christians we're called to reach them, but it was that they, uh, they loved the things that unbelievers love that caused them to rebel against the gospel. The problem wasn't the relationship with the unbelievers. They were called to reach them as Christians, but it was the problem of loving the things that the unbelievers love that caused them to rebel against the gospel and the apostle Paul. It's the idol and the false gods of culture. It was division, politics, ideology, expressive individualism. It was uh, power. It was sex. It was giftings of a character. These are some of the things that if you read Corinthians, these people are really messed up. And I would agree, so are we, if we were to be honest. So when it comes to the evangelism and discipleship and leadership of the next generation, we, like Paul, must not just tell them the do's and don'ts so as to put more restrictions on them. We must show them a greater promise than what the world promises them by reminding them of the covenant. And here's our definition. A covenant is a relational agreement, a partnership toward a specific purpose, treated with the utmost commitment and respect. See, God promises of himself a home and holiness and that we can have new affections and new relationships because of the promises that God has made to us that produces freedom, not restrictions. And I believe that's what the Spirit of God is wanting to do through the Scriptures. So number one, God promises himself. Verse 16, it says, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And see, these promises are part of the relational agreement between God and his people. We see this promise in Leviticus 26, Exodus 6, Exodus 29, Isaiah 52, Ezekiel 37, Jeremiah 31, Hebrews 8, 10 through 13, Revelation 2, Revelation 21. You see, this scripture is actually verses 16 through 18. It's a quotation of six or more Old Testament promises to Israel that have been fulfilled and is being fulfilled. And they're always referencing a people that is in exile or away from home or away from God such as Israel in slavery to Egypt for 400 years. Israel in Babylon, exile. That have been, and it, he's fulfilling these things in the New Testament with the New Covenant. You see, from the Garden Temple of Eden, where God dwelled with Adam and Eve, to Moses in Israel, where God dwelled with his people in the tabernacle, to Solomon, where God dwelled with his people in the first temple, to Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, where God dwelled with us as fully God and fully man to the church where we are now today, where God now sends his Holy Spirit to dwell with us and in us so that together we form the temple of the living God as the church. And as individual Christians, we become many temples where God's spirit dwells. This is where we are now, but now we're looking forward to the promise of the new heavens and the new earth. This is the new Jerusalem where the Lord God Almighty is the temple himself who eternally dwells with man God has and is fulfilling his promise to us of himself, dwelling with us and becoming our God and we his people. God dwelling with us is how the story begins and ends from Genesis to Revelation. He's upholding his side of the relational argument. See, God's promises himself. However, the promise comes with a call. Let's look at verse 17. He says, therefore, go out from the midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you. But there's a problem. Since the fall of man, we could not dwell with the holy God because of our sin, but there was a call. With Adam and Eve, he walked in the cool of the garden of the day, and he called out to Adam and said, where are you? With Moses, he called to the people of Israel and said, I will bring you out from the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will redeem you from slavery, and you will be my people, and I will be your God. 
with Isaiah and Ezekiel to Israel to call the people out of Babylon saying, go out from the midst and be separate from them. Touch no unclean thing. He sent and he welcomes and he sent Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us to dwell among us and to walk among us to show us who God is and what he's like. And, believe, and he says, repent and believe the gospel so that we can have a relationship with him. See, this call is first and foremost a call to himself. It's a call out of running away and hiding from God. It's a call out of shame. It's a call out of slavery to our sin. It's a call out of addiction. It's a call out of isolation. It's a call first and foremost to himself. And I want to say that God is calling a generation to out and to himself. And it, now is a, day, a favorable time of salvation. Now is the day he says, I will make my dwelling among you and walk among you. I will be your God and you will be my people. Go out, be separate, touch no unclean thing. And when we come to him, he says, welcome home. Number two, God promises a home with spiritual family. Verse 18, I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And I said home and not a house, because we know that a house is not a home. A house is just a physical structure. A church building is just a physical structure. What makes a house a home is a family that dwells within it. It's the relationship with God and with one another. And like the theologian for the old generation here, like the theologian Luther Vandross sings, I'm not meant to live alone, but turn this house into a home. And what God is saying to us is that you're not meant to live alone. Turn this house into a home. And I have a, and I'll just say this. My wife and I came here to the Palladium about the beginning of this month for a date night, and we made a mistake. Because it was, it was for a $3 movie, but our movie was at 10.45 p.m. on a Saturday. And we didn't know the movie was two and a half hours. And so we ended up leaving this Palladium Theater about 1.30, and I said, Aisha, we might as well stay here because I have to be back here in about five or six hours. I said, why even go home? But something happened when we left the theater, and I went home. But when I came back, I woke up. I came back to a home. But when I saw the trailer pull up, it was not what was present, but who was present. It was Pastor Ben, and it was Javon who rolls in about 7.45, then 8.45, 7.45, then the ushers at 8.15, and the children's ministry workers, and then you guys will get here about uh, more of our first uh, igniting, we get here about 9.30, and then some of you guys will scroll in about 10.05, who am I kidding, 10.15, 10.25, you know that's you. I'm just playing with your family. It's not what was present. This church equipment does not make a church. It's us. It's the relationship. He said, I will be a father to you, and you should be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. He's calling us to a spiritual family where we get to know the fatherhood of God in a loving, personal relationship with him as, as our father and enjoy access to his presence. And with each other as brothers and sisters, we grow in our sonship and our daughtership and our brotherhood and our sisterhood. Notice the communal language here that God says, I'll be a father to you. You shall be sons and daughters. The Christianity is not personal, but it's communal. We must remember that this call to, was to Israel and to Judah and to the church, not just individual persons. Even in our prayers, we say, our father, we're called to be saints together it's a multi-generational spiritual family. It's a multi-ethnic spiritual family. When I became a Christian, two things changed my understanding of family. One, when I became a Christian in 2016, and two, when I married in, into a Hispanic family. You can laugh when San Antonio. It's okay. But I'm so thankful for church-based campus ministry when I was discipled at the University of North Texas by 30s and 40-year-olds. Joe Navarro and Cody Luce and Christian Claudio, they came on the campus, and Pastor Ken Du, who was in his 60s at the time, they understood that the next generation was so important that they would come to our campus to pray and to God test students. Not only that, it didn't end there. Then it was Ernie Kruger, and they brought me into their home, and they showed me. I got to see what a Christian household looks like. It was, I, saw, I got to see what a Christian husband, a father, and a brother, and a sister looks like in these homes. And now, as a Christian, as a husband, as a father, as a brother, I don't stand alone, but I stand on the shoulders of the generation before me, and that's how it should be. 
for the next generation. My wife and I were talking about why we love campus ministry so much, and it's important for our children. John Mark and AJ, so I think they can see the cool college students, Mr. Joseph and Adelise and Alicia and everyone else that are sitting here in this row, so that they can know Christianity is not just for the old people. Christianity is not just for later, it's for right now. So when my son comes to campus and he's handing out flowers like this, and he's running away and put him in, in our stroller, but he's, he sees the kingdom of God is growing. He's seeing baptism. He said, hey, where's Mr. Joseph? Where's Mr. Javon? And so the, the kingdom is growing. Our family is growing. That's what this is about. And that's why we're doing Promises Life Group. We're not in one. I want to encourage you to get into one. We become a part of a family. And a family this size, on our Sunday mornings, our life groups, our campus nights, our luminous church youth meetings, we should ask who's not here. Not just who's here, but who's not here? Who's missing? There's a lot of empty seats. Who's not here? Is it your neighbor? Is it your sibling? Because we know they're missing out on the promise of God. God promises himself. He promises a home. Lastly, God promises holiness. Oh, but well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. And you're right. Salvation is through faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. However, as Tony Evans says, you don't have to be married to go home. You don't have to go home to be married, but stay away long enough, and your relationship will be affected. You stay away from God himself and his people, the home that he wants to bring us into. I will argue that your relationship will be affected. Your holiness will be affected. Covenant is a relational agreement. A partnership toward a specific purpose, treated with the utmost commitment and respect. Number three, God promises holiness. Second Corinthians seven one. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Is that a joke? We get this question all the time. If this promise is true, then why are Christians such hypocrites? God promises holiness? Are you kidding me? If that's true, I've been praying for my husband and for my wife. They're still doing the same thing after the umpteenth argument, and I'm still uh, just, we're just having constant blow-up arguments. Don't look at them right now. Just look at me, but why do we miss this? Why are we not experiencing what Christ has for us? Well, it's because you can't menu a little Jesus. You can't just receive him as a, as a coach or a spiritual guide. You either receive him as a stronger partner in the covenant, or you don't receive him at all. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. It must be said that this point is more applicational about how the promises of God apply to us, how they change us. God promises to make us holy, both in the inner and outer man. And both our body and the spirit, the defilement of the body, are the outward sins. Sexual immorality is adultery, it's lying, it's stealing, it's murder, it's gossip. Those are the outer sins and outer defilement. The defilement of the spirit are the inward sins that people can't see. It's pride, it's self-righteousness, it's legalism, it's bitterness, it's unforgiveness, un unforgiveness it's victim mentality. It's negative thoughts. How is your thought life? If we were to get an iPad and everyone wants to see your thoughts, would you be as holy as you outwardly appear to be? But we must understand our partnership with God toward that specific purpose of holiness, that there are two types of cleansing. Number one is a justifying cleansing, one that can only happen when we come into a relationship with Jesus and we, we, we put our faith and trust in his a sacrificial atonement on the cross. As we confess our sins, we know that he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all Unrighteousness. This just puts us back into relational agreement with God. This puts us back in right standing with Him. Number two is sanctifying cleansing. One that happens as we partner with God toward our holiness, as we treat our relationship with Him with the utmost respect and commitment. It's the, it's the means of grace, it's reading, it's fasting, it's prayer, it's life group attendance, it's going to church, it's a daily confession and repentance of sins, it's accountability, it's setting up boundaries. This is all the things that God partners with us in to, bring, to sanctify us, to make us more and more holy. I love what Dale Johnson says, that if we were to take up God and his promise to himself and to a home, he says this, I could have used the word holy, 
but I chose purity because that is what holy is. Purity himself, speaking of this trinity, draws near to us to draw us within the circle of purity. The trinity is crying out, do not be afraid. The purity will not fire you. It will only burn away all that is not pure. Bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. God wants to make you holy. He wants you to be set apart, to be pure. You know what they say now? I've been going to football practice at UTSA. And after they played UT, I asked them about number five, B. John Robinson. He's supposed to be the next Reggie Bush. And I said, man, what was it like playing him? And they said, he's just different. He's different. And that's all, that, all they, could, they could say. He's different. That's what they say when someone is set apart from their peers. And so my question is, when others look at you, would they say he's different? She's different. They wouldn't use the word holy because they they're not in church, but they would say he's just different. Because when you see Jesus and his promises, clearly he makes a difference in you. And when he makes a difference in you, he sends you to make a difference around you. When you see Jesus and his promise, clearly he makes a difference in you. And when he makes a difference in you, he sends you to make a difference around you, on your campus, in your community, in your family. So how do we bring this holiness to completion? The answer is the fear of God. It's the fear of God. It's the reverential awe and obedience. It's going back to the state of belovedness that Paul talks about in verse 1. That as we are immersed in this relationship and we grow in our understanding of who God is, and we're committed in our relationship with him, we're committed in our relationship with one another, that will bring holiness to completion in the fear of God. It means to treat our relationship with God and his people with utmost commitment and respect. It's not treating him, uh, our relationship with him as friends with benefits or no strings attached. Where you want the promises and blessings of God without... God himself, not understanding that God's promise first and foremost to us is of himself. Teenagers, college students, yesterday, September 24th, five years ago to that date, September 24th, 2017, I proposed to Aisha. But what if I told her on that day, I use this illustration all the time, what if I told her on that day, hey, I want to marry you, but I marry you five days or six days out of the week. On those days, I can be with who I want. I can do what I want. If it's Saturday and Sunday, don't bother me because it's college football on Saturday and then it's NFL football on Sunday. But then you hold down the home front, right? You feed me. You do my laundry. You make sure everything's clean. You do that for me, right? What do you think she would have said? No, why? Because she knows her value, her worth. And that, that's not a committal relationship. But somehow we think that we can come to God that way. You say, you know what, God, I'll be in a relationship with you. But I'll be in a relationship with you one day or two days out of the week. I'll go to church on Sunday and I'll go to life group maybe on Wednesday or Sunday afternoon. But don't bother me any other day of the week. But you make sure to put food on my table. You provide and get me the job offers that I want. You make sure that I have all the blessings without you. But don't ask me about my relationship. Don't ask me how I'm doing when I'm looking at things I shouldn't look at. I just want you one day or two days out of the week. And what I love about water baptism is that these five that have accepted the good news of Jesus' proposal, that's what this is. That he made on the cross through his life and his death. He said, I want to be in a relationship with you. I will dwell among you. I will walk among you. I will be your God, and you should be mine. Because I'm promising you myself. Because I promise you myself, if you say yes to me and no to the world, as we sang, the Father will welcome you, and he promises you a home. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. He's going to prepare a place for you. This is what the Father will do. I'm promising you that you'll be holy. And we come to him with our sin and our past, and we say, knowing this about me, do you still want to be with me? Jesus, you know my sin, you know my past, do you still want to be with me? 
You know, some of you had roommates that if you knew everything about them before you signed that lease, you wouldn't have ever signed it in the first place. That's why I didn't have roommates. I just, maybe I was that bad roommate. But I just avoided it altogether. But the truth is, Jesus, he knows everything about you. He sees you. He knows your past. He knows your addictions. He knows your uh, proclivities. He knows your isolation. He knows your depression. He knows your anxiety. And he says, look, I know everything about you. And I still want to be with you. Well, Jesus, how do I know that you're going to keep your promise? He's speaking to his disciples. Three days. Three days. I will rise from the grave. I'm going back to the Father. You won't see me. But I'm sending the promise of my Father from on high, the Holy Spirit, who will dwell with you and who will be in you. And I will give you my spirit of the guarantee. I'm giving you myself. And you will be brothers. You have many brothers and sisters. You have a home. And if you stay with me, then I will, and you commit to me. And, and you treat this relationship with the utmost commitment and respect by the publicly declaring Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And to be a part of his global church and local luminous church. And he will make you holy. He wants to bring us to himself. He promises a home. He promises holiness. But church, my question is, would you turn this house into a home for the next generation? Would you pray for the next generation? Would you be a spiritual family to students away from family? Would you take a student to lunch? You don't have to take all of them. Do for one what you wish you could do for all. Would you bring them into your home? Let them see how you take a hold of God's promises and live them out. There's a saying, it takes a village to raise a child, but I would say it takes a church to raise a generation. Next gen, youth, college students, would you make this church a home? Would you say yes to Jesus' call? Make this a home. Become a part of the spiritual family. Go to growth track. Would you serve these people? Would you serve God? Would you love them? Would you ask them questions? Would you honor them? Pick their brains. Build a relationship with, with them. Don't just come in and out. Would you become sons and daughters of this house and not just guests? Not just orphans. Let's pray. As we're praying, there's two groups of people I want to pray for. One, have you fully surrendered your life to Christ and placed your trust in him? If you haven't accepted Jesus' proposal, I want to pray for you, and that's something that you want to do. You want to come to himself. You want to become a part of his home that he provides for you, and you want to be holy. You're tired of your sin. You're tired of your addiction. You're tired of slavery. And you can just pray this prayer. Say, Father in heaven, I am so sorry for my sins. I thank you that you sent your son Jesus as the fulfillment of your promises. And that as I walk, step into a relationship with you through faith and repentance, I say no to the world and I say yes to you. Would you forgive me of all my sins and unrighteousness? And would you make me whole? Would you make me holy? In Jesus' name. The second group, that maybe there's one of these areas that maybe you haven't come to God consistently. Well, you haven't been a part of his home, his spiritual family, and you find yourself disconnected. Or maybe your holiness is lacking in some areas. There's a promise of repentance for you. So, Father, I thank you for what you're doing in each and every single person in here. Lord, would you make your home among us? Lord, would you bring them back that they would know that this promise is eternal, it's everlasting. Lord, sanctify us by your spirit. Sanctify us together as we're called to be saints with one another. Give us the vulnerability and the transparency to come down to the altar, to go to life group and confess, saying, man, I'm not doing as well as I, I thought I should be doing. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.